people who are live streaming at the moment. Mm. Uh, and so just maybe a minute. Uh, okay, but first of all, there's nobody on this yet. So uh, just be a minute. Oh, here we are. Okay. Well, I've uh, just put a, a link to this new stream uh, on there. So hopefully we'll have some people coming in in just a minute, I can say with some certainty that this is um, uh, this is working for now. So for the few of you who have uh, migrated over from our old broken stream, it seems like the world is pretty much uh, live streaming right now, which I think has caused a few problems with YouTube. Uh, but thank yeah. you for uh, coming along with us. Uh, this is uh, Rebecca Heyman, who's Hi. our trusty OG editor, who's uh, going to come and uh, critique the first times that you guys have been uh, submitting here. Uh, embarrassingly enough, I have to say, I was talking to nobody for about <laughs> four minutes before we realized that nobody was seeing this. I was too, so we, we you were talking to me. I was talking to you at the very least. Um, so yeah, we're gonna let people sort of pour in. I just have to sort of see, because I can have the old window open, uh, which is just the uh, empty, uh, which is all the people. There's 350 people there. So as soon oh, as no. I all filter over here, uh, then we'll start. Thank you, everyone. We can let them all admire my cat until we're ready to start. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Guys, while we're waiting for everyone to uh, come in, uh, Becca, could you introduce your cat? This is Primrose Everkitten. Um, uh, she is my editorial assistant. When she was a kitten, she used to lay across my shoulders like a mink stole uh, while I sat at my desk. And we've been, um, you know, editing books together ever since. She's my spirit animal. Amazing. <laughs> uh, while, while people are filtering in, uh, might as well just go through the basics of uh, what we're going to do. Thank you so much for coming across. Uh, this is the second live stream we've done in about five days where there's been an issue. Uh, but as our way of saying sorry, there is a cat. Um, <laughs> however, thank you for figuring this all out and coming over. Uh, thank you again also for sending over your first lines. Uh, Becca's going to critique them in just a minute once everyone's come over into this stream. As I mentioned to uh, nobody, because I was talking to myself thinking that this is live streaming, uh, we had over 500 people send in their first lines. Uh, and of that, uh, we're hopefully going to do as many as we can, but I don't see us doing more than about 30, maybe a little bit over that. Uh, but Becca's kindly offered to, in the next few days, uh, record a few more of these offline that we'll then post uh, on our webpage. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, if you want to see, uh, any of those videos come up, just, uh, I don't know, like and subscribe this video, and then uh, you'll get a notification when those things pop up. Thank you so much. I see 300 people in the new stream. Wow, that's amazing. And 146 still in the old one. Maybe some of those, there's some doubling up. Uh, but Martin, they've asked for the, for the other link to be sent again. Oh, OK. I think. I'll put those. Uh, I've put the new link in there. Well, it's sort of posted. At a bunch of places in the old video, uh, so should be able to see that. Uh, so yes, I'm going to. Let's. I think you know what we've uh, sort of procrastinate enough. Uh, we'll add a little bit of time at the end of this. Uh, but yeah, Becca, could you uh, just do the, the oh, no, intro all over again? A minute ago, and just explain a bit about yourself and what we're going to do here. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, I'm going to do the short version of my bio, which is I've been editing since I graduated from NYU with a BAMA in English and American Literature. Um, I work with mostly adult and YA fiction. I've been doing that, um, you know, for about, what year is it? Doing it for, I guess, 13 years now. Um, I work with authors who self-publish. I work with authors who want to publish traditionally. A lot of the work I do is developmental, meaning I'm looking at your best version of your draft before you've queried and we're thinking about how to make it even better uh, and even more spectacular and i um you know I, I i love my work i'm super happy to be here i'm super grateful to be here and i hope you're all at home and safe and healthy and i'm i'm ready to start i'm ready to get going okay uh i think everyone's in there 
Uh, someone just said something quite nice about your hair, but I can't, can't find it to post it on screen, so sadly that will have to go without. Uh, I'm going to disappear off here, and then uh, we'll get started with the first ones. Just so you all know, Becca's never seen these before, uh, so this is all fresh reactions. Yes. Here's the first one. And the prince married the princess, and they lived happily ever after. Okay, so um, it's always tricky to start with dialogue, especially dialogue that's already in progress, right? So um, we know that this is cueing an inversion, perhaps, of what we would consider a typical fairy tale. And I think there might be um, a slightly more effective way to do this, just because starting with dialogue doesn't give me a lot of purchase about who the speaker is or why I care about hearing them speak. So I think it's an interesting concept. I like a beginning that begins at the end of something else, um, but I would I would potentially keep tinkering with this. Okay, that was uh, My Beautiful Freckled Boy by Shana Peck, it's a uh, fiction. I'm imagining this is almost like the beginning of uh, The Princess Bride where uh, a story is being told. That's the first thing that came to mind to me, um, or, um, sort of setting the stage that we have someone who has been raised on fairy tales and is going to have those fairy tale archetypes inverted in their story, which is interesting to me. Um, but I think we just have to make sure that we're drawing readers in at the very first moment. Okay, next one here. So this is a small town summer. Okay, this is the beginning of what could be a really great sentence. I'd like to see a colon here. So this is a small town summer, colon, and then a list of very specific, very unique things about small town summers that almost feel universal to the small town summer experience, right? Um, cut off jean shorts and um, like walking to the corner store for a cold drink or jumping off a dock into a lake. I want to um, take this idea of what we all know about a small town summer and expand on it so that this really captures our interest and sets the stage. This is the beginning. This is a good beginning, but it's not it's not the end of the beginning. All right, that was uh, uh, Five's Company by Shay Watson, uh, a fantasy book. I think Ooh. it could be like an urban fantasy or modern fantasy. Yeah, I would say probably urban, right? I mean, we suspect anyway. Unless it's a small town summer on Klingon, which, you know. <laughs> All right. That's a floating bear is something I don't think to myself anymore when I walk past a floating bear. Okay. Uh, I think, so this makes me think of a carnival. This makes me think of somebody who is being desensitized to something really fantastical. Uh, and so, that's good. You have my brain going in that direction. I hope it's the right direction. Um, you don't need a comma after bear. Indirect, this is called indirect speech, right? When no one is actually speaking this dialogue, but the character is thinking about what they've thought about in the past or what they've said in the past. And uh, for that reason, according to the Chicago Manual of Style, we don't need a comma after that indirect dialogue. So. That's the floating bear, nicks the comma, is something I don't think to myself anymore when I walk past a floating bear. Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm The more I look at it, the more I'm here for it. I like this one. Ooh. Uh, kind of strange, right? What is it? Yeah, also, I have cat hair in my mouth. It's from a short story called, And Then the Floating Bears Came. Um, <laughs> by Juliana Suderman. Um, when I read it, I was imagining that these bears were just like floating dead down a river, like it was some sort of dystopian thing. Oh, I was thinking like, uh, like carnival, like sort of, I, hmm, you really went to a dark place and you got there fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I guess that's the difference between the two of us, right? I'm like, oh, maybe <laughs> there's cotton candy. And you're like, maybe there's an apocalypse. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know who's right. <laughs> I hope oh, it's ne me. Next one's here. Hi, my name's Fanny. Yeah, I know. I hate it too. <sighs> I don't hate it, and this is the problem, right? Uh, because truly, I I, um, I love an old-fashioned name, right? Uh, both of my kids have really old-fashioned names, and I, I think that much like a generalization or a rhetorical question, the problem that we run into here is that we're offering, um, we're suggesting that we know how our reader feels when we don't. And so I'm more interested in Fanny hating her name than in why she thinks I might hate her name. 
Ah, that one is, uh, yeah, like, I think over here, like, Fanny means something slightly different to over there, in, but in both, both cases, probably not something that modern ladies like to be named. Totally understand how it would not be the most flattering name, um, but I also don't hate it. So if anything that it harkens back to another time is very interesting to me. And so I'm, I mean, if this is YA, I understand, or if this is middle grade, I understand, because we would expect children to be especially cruel about a name like this. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I think the takeaway here is that you shouldn't make assumptions about your reader, about who they are, how they feel, or or how they'll respond to any kind of input. So you should be focused on showing us how your character feels about things instead of trying to project what your character feels onto your reader, because those two things may not connect. And if your reader's first thought is, well, wait, no, I don't that's not true, you know, then you're setting up a negative right away when what we want to do with an opening to a novel is pull people in. Uh, cool. Uh, well, there's a thing going on in the chat. Some people didn't know uh, how to actually submit uh, first lines to this. We actually have a newsletter over at Readsy. Uh, one of my colleagues is going to paste the link into here. Uh, so if you want to actually take part in the next one, you need to sign up to our newsletter and you'll be told days in advance and then you can send it in. So sorry if uh, you didn't have the chance to do that. We're uh, always on Eventbrite. Uh, if you want another way to make sure you never miss out on one of these, um, you can follow, I think, the link I just posted there. Sign up to our thing on Eventbrite. You'll never miss uh, the next one of these. Uh, that last one, uh, Becca, was from Fanny's Affairs. Uh, it's a romance novel. I think that's so sort of fits not way. <laughs> Definitely not way. I wonder if it's, uh, we're talking about how old fashioned his name is. If the author is uh, on the stream and you could tell us whether or not this is historical romance or regency or if this is contemporary, I'd, I guess I'd be, I guess the word, use of the word yeah makes me think this is contemporary, but I guess, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by an oddly named character, <laughs> I guess. Um, well, we've got actually one coming up later, hopefully, some great character names I quite like. Uh, here's the next one. Gosh. An Italian-American needs hyphenation. An Italian-American single mother and a Colombian-American Catholic priest walk into a bar, but this is no joke. I love it. Um, I'm not sure why this author would hyphenate Colombian-American and not hyphenate Italian-American, um, but we do want to see hyphenation on any kind of um, uh, dual nationality identity markers. Uh, an Italian-American single mother and a Colombian-American Catholic priest walk into a bar, but this is no joke. I don't know how I feel about that comma. I suppose it's grammatically correct, but I don't know it's tonally effective. Maybe look at an M dash there, that's a long dash, uh, and, and see if that helps the punchline fall a little um, a little harder. See if that works. But I, I like this a lot. What, what is this from? Uh, this is from The Eulogist by Maria Bronia, uh, literary fiction. The Eulogist, Whew, great title. Yes, yeah. I'm here for that, I like that. I sit in horror as my two children tear into each other's flesh. Okay. Um, alarming, evocative, uh, somewhat inflammatory. It's got all the makings. Do you want to go? Prim, this was this one scared Primmy. Um, it's got all the makings of, of a really compelling first novel, first line in the sense that it, it draws me in and I want to know more. Um, so yeah, good job. I'm I'm intrigued. Cool. Uh, that was from Ways Off by Isabel Dobich. Dobich. Uh, it's a horror, as you might imagine. Oh, so it's actual literal tearing into each other's flesh, huh? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, did, you, did you think it was a... <laughs> I was super hoping it was metaphorical, but, you know, that's also fine. So, yeah, it does start with it. A pretty literal. Imagine the next sentence probably uh, dives into more detail. Uh, the next one here. I switched off the lights and sank into my bed, exhausted by the day I had just went through. Uh, I don't love the grammatical execution here. We would we would really say the day I had just gone through. <laughs> I'm sorry about the cat. Um, I switched off the lights and sank into my bed, exhausted by the day I had just gone through. You know, I'd rather see the exhausting day knowing right off the bat that we're going to move into some kind of retrospective where the narrator then tells me about the bad day or the exhausting day is somewhat deflating. Uh, whereas if we begin at the, 
in, in the middle of, of the exhausting day, I think um, you'll, you'll probably do more to draw readers in. I'm not sure just hearing that someone is tired and then why is as interesting as seeing this all unfold. And that one uh, was A Curse at Midnight by Mustafa Mbake Diop. I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, and it's a, a fantasy novel. Uh, cool. Coming up next. It's your tail on my coffee. Uh, May is harvesting day, said Dave with a squeal as he spun in a circle and bounced on his wheels. Can I cheat and ask for the genre on this? Is this? I think you already know what genre it is. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a picture book. Yes. Well, I, I know it's fiction, but do we get any other clues? It's, it's a picture book. Oh, it's a picture. <laughs> okay, I was I, so I, I had a couple of ideas here. Um, I think spun in a circle and bounce on his wheels means that Dave might be in a wheelchair, which we love to see. It's super important, especially in picture books, to get representation on the page so that kids know that their stories are being seen and heard and that their stories matter. Um, you know, I think this is an example of dialogue that actually sets a, a, a valuable tone and does some really good work. Um, and part of this is because the dialogue tag actually does some heavy lifting in terms of setting the stage about who our protagonist is and what the book is actually about, right? Which I assume is Mace Harvesting Day. So I think this works. Awesome. I should say that picture books are not my area of expertise. I really work with YA and above. Middle grade and below is not my bread and butter. Um, so, you know, maybe other people would have a different take on this. But for me, this is a pretty effective first line. Cool. And we that's a, a work in progress with no title. I imagine it might be called Maze Harvesting Day. Uh, by Could Rick be. <laughs> uh, next one here. I finally decided to quit my job Monday morning right as my ever-widening Fanny dropped into the overpriced office chair at Wiley Investigations. Um, noting for the record, two instances of the word Fanny in two totally different contexts in a single first line frenzy, not something you see every day. Um, there's a lot of information in this line, but I'm not sure how valuable all of it is. Um, the idea of quitting is important. Um, this this adverb here, finally decided, is good because it tells us this isn't a spur of the moment decision. So something's been brewing for our first for our um, main character for a while. I'm not sure. Could you not? Excuse me. Um, I'm not sure how uh, the ever widening Fanny and the overpriced office chair are valuable descriptors. And so what I would say to people is, number one, be aware of overloading your reader with descriptive language, especially right at the outset of your novel. Um, we want your verbs to be incredibly strong and your nouns incredibly specific. And that's going to bring your prose into a very strong place. So um, I think this sentence relies a little too much on descriptions of things that don't add big value to my experience of this information. So do I know less if these details about an ever widening fanny and an overpriced author, do I, do I, is my takeaway less um, coach or less complete if we out those cues? And for me, the answer is probably not. I think we could get the same takeaway without those cues. And, and that tells me they might be a little on the fluffy, useless side. Uh, that was from The Metal Man, uh, author Chad, last name withheld. Uh, it's a mystery mystery novel. Okay, well, you know, starting, I'm trying to look around the cat's giant head. Prim, go away, go get a treat from daddy. Okay, Prim has left the building. <laughs> yeah, so a mystery novel that starts in a PI's office, good, maybe a little obvious. I think that line has a little ways to go. Okay, next up. The trawler's engine was straining to maintain speed. Hmm. Okay. This feels like uh, a notable fact, but I'm not sure I'm interested yet in, in this fact. Um, 
because I don't know why they're strained. If you could take this a little bit further and articulate why they're strained on the engine, that might be interesting. Is it because we're being pursued and the trawler is not designed for speed? Um, is it because we're suddenly uphill? Like why? I think the why here is a really important piece of information that probably gets introduced in sentence two. And I would say work a little harder to get this into sentence one. This is a very short sentence, which is fine, but that tells me there's a little room to grow it and we could be doing a little bit more. Cool, that was uh, from A Gulf Stream of Trouble, uh, a, a crime novel, mystery novel as well. Imagine okay. it starts off in, in Harbor. Uh, next one. A dentist sporting a mohawk was at his desk designing a print ad for a real estate client. Um, mohawk as a hairstyle is not capitalized. I believe mohawk when it's capitalized is referring to um, a Native American nation uh, or tribe. And so I would really check your check your capitalization there. I'm not an expert on that, but my guess is hairstyles are generally not. I mean, I know hairstyles are not capitalize, but you should know what you're queuing when you do capitalize it. And I think you are queuing an entire culture. So a dentist sporting a lowercase mohawk was at his desk. Well, we can say sat at his desk, right? Bit of a stronger verb there. Designing a print ad for a real estate client. So why is it important that this person is a dentist? If he's designing ads, I'm a little confused. There, There's more than one um, professional queue here, a dentist and a real estate client. I just Again, this is a lot of information. I don't know how valuable all of that information is. And the takeaway here isn't as compelling. I think the idea of including the Mohawk and this disorientation between a dentist designing an ad is supposed to create a feeling of dissonance or confusion or even absurdity, but it's not really pulling through. I think we can do more here and I might be interested in the ad itself, especially if it's funny. or or if it has a specific slogan that's funny. Um, I think you could get two minutes further into this scene and find a better opening image. Uh, yeah, and I, I had to look into this one a bit. It's from a book called All Out by Nicole Kilkarni. Uh, it's a non-fiction, it's a sports biography. And I looked into this actual character uh, that he talks about and he was like a trained dentist who then is now like a designer at, uh, uh, Ogilvy, uh, at Ogilvy now. And so, oh. um, but I think by the sounds of it, the book is about cricket. So I think this is just like an opening picture of just okay. one guy who's <laughs> doing ad, ad art now. Um, um, okay. You know, I still, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sticking to my guns here. Yeah. I still think we can just fast forward a few minutes and see where we are. Um, it was a, mm, was it a dark stormy night? It was a dark stormy night and Marley was dead. But call me Ishmael when the clocks are striking 13. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to assume this is has designs on literary fiction or satire, uh, obviously invoking this very typical purple prose. It was a dark, stormy night. Though I will say, if you're really doing a send up, if you're really doing a parody, you might as well use the, the, the line as it's written. You know, it was a dark and stormy night actually comes from a piece of writing that was later held up as a prime example of purple prose. So while you could replace the and in dark and stormy night with a comma, I, I believe if you're reaching for this parody that you should use and there instead. Um, but call me Ishmael when the clocks are striking 13. You're starting to lose me there. Um, it's it's funny to people who understand these references, but I, I don't know that it's uh, inviting more questions. Um, I would like to see this take itself just a little bit more seriously. What's the genre on this? Well, uh, it's uh, the guy, uh, Ed Cobley, uh, it's called Attack of the Genre, uh, genre Zombies, and it's supposed to be a parody of uh, a genre parody, so I guess he's mashed up all these sort of well-known first lines. Okay, you like, know. Yeah. I I think the market for parody is small when it's this dense. I think contemporary parody has to be a little bit more subtle. Um, you know, the other thing I'll say is that this kind of thing is going to get categorized as literary fiction. It's not going to do well on self-publishing. It's probably going to need to be traditionally published. And even then, I think that the the readership for something like this is small. Uh, uh, 
a, a genre is not an end in and of itself. You you have to be privileging story over genre. And so if if the whole story is really just a wink about cleverness, um, I'm not sure who the reader is here. Yeah, like for me, this one is like, I think it's one of those ones where like, you can pat yourself on the back if you understand all these references. But this, right, like good this, for this you. This joke doesn't work in isolation. The sentence doesn't make sense by itself. I agree. And yeah, I, I think I think that's spot on. If you want to take over, I can <laughs> <laughs> step back. Um, Grandpa worshipped a rock. Okay. I mean, I, I think if we think historically about um, about the development of spirituality and religion globally, this is not actually such a remarkable sentence. Um, worship of nature and or worship of idols is pretty prevalent in you know history, and so this feels again more like a fact to me and a, sort of a line that draws me in. So I would do more with this. This is too short. Um, I'm interested in the narrator's reaction to this worship more than I am in the worship itself. I think you're along the right line. That was Blood of the Bellamy by Laura Shank is a YA fantasy, so it probably digs into that some sort of primal spirituality and religion stuff. Yeah, I think we can go a little further in, in order to draw people in, for sure. All right, next one. My third pregnancy was different. Woof. Um, having had two pregnancies, I feel for this person. <laughs> um, again, is fact and facts are interesting but they're not necessarily as compelling as a more editorialized um sentence so tell me how maybe unlike my first two pregnancies my third pregnancy and then hit me with the difference so don't tell me it's different show me the difference get that show don't tell uh is like often touted as really good writing wisdom, and it is in certain cases, and this is one of them. So don't tell me about this, show me this, boom. Cool, uh, that was Calling Brian Back. Uh, it's a memoir by uh, Mary, ba uh, Mary Bailey. Uh, another one now. Aurora did not mind the screams. Uh, it's, I guess a big day for horror, is this horror? I don't know. Uh, is, are these human screams, are they? I don't know, dolphin screams? I don't know, I need more here to understand what's going on. Uh, did not mind is, well, didn't mind is a bit more, more casual and tonally probably more welcoming to most readers. So this is again, too short and we need more information. Uh, that one uh, is Casting Away, a paranormal romance by Pascal Cabana, no relation. Uh, <laughs> Next one. I was having a good day before I nearly got incinerated. Good. Great. I think this is pretty good. I wouldn't change this. I think this moves nicely. There's a good um, sort of unexpected twist at the end. Uh, I think it's, yeah, good. Thumbs up. That's a uh, Joseph Eicher science fiction called Century, Century 32, The Magenta Conflict. I'll show you why I paused there. The title is Century XXXII, which takes a little while to scan and say. Yeah, it does. But a cool title and seems really on point for the genre. So good job. And next one. Grandmare sways over the edge of the stone stairs into the cavern, and I step between her and eternity, woozy from the bloody tang of her head bandage. You had me until woozy. Um, I love here and the tone using ground mare really uh feels i think the the combination of ground mare and stepping between her and infinity really gives puts a fine point on the tone here uh woozy from the bloody tang of her head bandage i like less and here's why uh, wooziness generally we would expect to come from actual blood loss not from smelling someone else's blood um that's just you're losing me a little bit. If you can make that last uh, part of the phrase work a little with a little more clarity, um, maybe something about 
holding her breath, his or her breath, to avoid smelling the blood, that might cause dizziness or wooziness. Not sure you can cram that all into a single sentence, but maybe that's the direction we should go in. So not woozy from the smell itself, but from trying to avoid it. Does that make sense? Um, I think that's probably more accurate. So continues to to embody the narrator's experience, right? Instead of focusing on somebody else's body. Mm. Uh, this one, I really like the, the title and concept. It's a historical fiction called Champagne Widows, Verve, Clicquot, and Napoleon. Uh, I hope this, um, there's a, there's a, there's sort of a biography called, I think it was called House of Clicquot. No, that was House of Mondavi. There's a Verve, Clicquot, um, like non, beautiful nonfiction book that came out, it must be, Gosh, it's got to be nine, eight or nine years ago now. But they look into it. It was a beautiful cover and that gorgeous v um, sort of yellow orange on the cover when the hard hardback uh, came out. And that might be very useful to you right now if you haven't already read it, which you probably have. I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> awesome. Uh, next one here. The man who opened the door of the Chinese American Playful Friendship Society looked neither Chinese nor friendly. I love this. This is weird and wonderful and highly specific. I wouldn't change a thing. I think this is great. Um, it's it's light. It's totally consistent. There's a good sort of wordplay. There's a good sense of sort of um, linguistic mastery here. I'm um, I'm all in for this. I think this is wonderful. Amazing. That was a Faith Foster and the Life Wizard Way uh, by Brooke Allen. It's a middle grade novel. I agree. It's great. I love it. I love the title. I love the first line. Fantastic. Way to go. Ignatius, why is there a comma here? We don't need a comma here. Uh, a comma only goes around direct address, meaning a character's name when we are directly addressing. So yes, Ignatius, I did say bring me the cat, right? Uh, we don't automatically place a comma after every proper noun. Okay. Ignatius tilted his raspberry colored beret and read his morning paper in the cheery company of a steamy demitas quite large in his tiny paw of espresso. Okay, so we have a misplaced modifier of espresso needs to go closer to demitas. Otherwise we're saying that his paw is a, is a tiny paw made of espresso, which I don't think is your intention. Um, so this is very charming. All of the language here like screams charm to me, which I really, really like. Um, Ignatius tilted his raspberry colored beret. That's just lovely and read his morning paper in the cheery company of a steamy demitasse. Quite like, do we need demitas of espresso? I, I'm not sure we do. Why not just end this after tiny paw and nix the of espresso? Um, what this says to me is great concept, very clear world, world building. The author sees their world very clearly, but we might need a, a line edit a little sooner than, um, some others because when you go into developmental edits, if 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 the language or the grammar and mechanics are distracting, you're gonna have a hard time getting really solid beta feedback because people are gonna be distracted by that. So just keep that in mind. Maybe just get a Chicago manual of style and start perusing it. I keep mine right here on my bookshelf right next to my desk. It's a great resource and everybody should have one, but I think it's especially applicable here. Okay. Uh, there's some people talking in the uh, comments about how long this is going to go. I assure you, this is not going to go three hours. I've got to eat dinner at some point. <laughs> uh, we're going to maybe get another 10 minutes in of this. Uh, we're going to pound through a few more. That one, actually, uh, Rebecca, was Howl Crew Animalia. So I guess it was a uh, sort of human-animal hybrids, and it's a middle-grade novel. I'm wondering it does feel middle-grade, yeah. Very charming, very cute. I, I had to Google what a demitasse was. Even being a, a European elite, I, I did not know. Uh, okay, next one here. <laughs> <laughs> Blakely looked out from the stage, scanning the sea of gem-laden jewelry and perfectly tailored tuxedos, and wished, as always, that tonight was over. This makes me go, hmm, because how can we wish, as always, that a single night is over? Does this mean that every night that this happens, Blakely wishes the night were over, or has this night lasted forever? Are we in a Groundhog Day scenario where the same night keeps repeating? So 
this is a lot of descriptive language. Again, um, I don't know that we know more about this scenario because of sea of gem laden jewelry and perfectly tailored tuxedos, as opposed to saying the ballroom or looked out from the stage and scanned, you know, the sea of, um, you know, patrons dressed to the nines or whatever it is, um, and wished as always that tonight was over. Um, I have a very distracting bird feeder attached to my window, which some of you may have seen on my Twitter feed. And around this time of day, every day, I have this lovely set of goldfinches that comes and eats. And they're very charming, but very loud as they like themselves in bird seed. So I'm sorry for being distracted for a second. Um, Getting back to the point, there's too much information here that I don't need and not enough information that I do. The more interesting part of this is the repetition of tonight, whether or not it's the same night that repeats again and again, or if it's the same kind of night that keeps happening. And so I need more clarity and I need fewer sensory details. Cool. Uh, that one uh, is from Immortal Games, a historical fiction by the sounds of it. I think I remember it saying that it was from World War II. So okay. I quite like that sort of fills it out a bit, but uh, yeah. So cool. then, okay, so then it's probably not a Groundhog Day scenario. And so that means we also have a clarity problem. And so I would just find, you know, I think a lot of the author's attention here was focused on this middle phrase about what people are wearing. And I think that's probably less important than it might have first seemed. Uh, cool. Uh, next one here. Sahara had never applied mascara just for a phone call before, but these were desperate times. <laughs> Maybe she wasn't working from home or social distancing. Um, Sahara had never applied mascara just for a phone call before, but these were desperate times. No, I don't really understand what's going on. I mean, is this a video call? Why does she need to put on mascara for a phone call? Um, is this about sort of putting on a kind of armor and feeling very prepared and very powerful. You know, sometimes putting on makeup can make you feel that way. Um, I don't know enough about what's going on here. And so this is a line that makes me go, huh? And while we want our first lines to be intriguing, we don't want them to be puzzling. And so this is a little bit puzzling for me. Okay, that one was, uh, It's Raining Men, It's a Romance by Holly, last name also withheld. Okay. I love a romance. Okay, here's a, a couple of short ones coming away. Sarah checked the last item off her to-do list. Nope. <laughs> uh, either show me the last item on the list or show me her completing it, you know, back this up two minutes. But, um, it, what kind of list is it? Is it a bunch of things she was avoiding? Or are they household tasks? Uh, I need to know a lot more about what's going on here. This is another show don't tell scenario where you're telling me what she did after all of the action was over instead of showing me the action. So move your moment, move your opening either before this moment or after, but this isn't the moment. Cool, that's uh, My Best Decision by Carol Wolf. Thanks Carol for sending that one in. Into a town with many names strode a man with none. Oh, I like this one. This feels very spooky and I like that. Um, into a town with many names strode a man with none. This is fantastic. I love it. Look how beautiful it is. It's very spare. There's no punctuation other than the period. Uh, it's very specific. It's very lyrical. I wouldn't change a thing. I love this line. Give me, what's the genre on this? Uh, this one, uh, it's tough to tell. It wasn't featured in there. It's from a book called One Moment Too Few by Michael uh, Monkittrick. Uh, I, I get the sense of some sort of Western or some sort of like a, Oh no, this gives me like, um, this gives me YA urban fantasy vibes. I'm thinking, you know what it really reminds me of? There's a great book out right now by Christine Herman called The Devouring Gray and her sequel, I follow her on Twitter, her sequel comes out, I think April 21st. This is a great, super atmospheric YA novel. And it's that atmosphere that I'm getting here, this like kind of small town, you know, spooky sensation. I don't know what it is, but if you're out there, um, author of this, please tell us what your genre is. All right, Michael, I'll try to keep an eye on that. If you're here, let us know. Uh, there's uh, another one. Uh, we're gonna maybe go for, if you're okay with it, Becca, maybe just another, we'll do another six or so. 
Yeah, I'm plowing through them today. I'm doing a good job today. <laughs> we're, we're, keep, we're keeping the pace today. At one week old, my eyes opened and I saw five little furry creatures with punched in noses. Punched in needs to be hyphenated. When we are using um, a phrase like this as an adjective to modify nose, noses, we need to hyphenate it. Uh, at one week old, my so this must be a, a picture book or, or a, a kidlet yeah. of some kind. A, what is it? It's a children's book called Pickles the Pug. Pickles. Okay. Um, great. I think that's fine. I just fixed punctuation. I think it's great. I think for what it is, it's perfect. Cool. Uh, moving swiftly on. If you're anything like me, you might think being one of only two women in a pub full of handsome Irishmen would be a dream come true until you notice one of them pull a gun from the pocket of his brown leather jacket. Um, the reason I have to reread this so carefully is because the timing is a little tricky. First of all, there's absolutely no reason to draw the reader into forming an opinion, which we've talked about already today. So that, you know, you might recall that I think anytime you are drawing an assumption, making an assumption about your reader, you run into the problem of them saying, well, well, no, I mean, frankly, personally, I am not interested in being one of only two women in a pub full of handsome Irishmen or any other type of person. Um, I don't think of that as a positive scenario for me necessarily. And so already you're putting distance between me and this narrator when what we want is to draw people in. And so I would get rid of that, which is not serving this purpose at all and make it about our character, right? Um, I was I say instead, I was convinced being one of only two women in a pub full of handsome Irishmen was a dream come true until I noticed one of them. And we nix, I noticed this is filtering language. Um, filtering language is language that articulates the use of a sensory organ. So, um, you know, I saw him pull out a gun. He pulled out a gun. I know you saw it because that's how you receive visual information is with your eyeballs. So I don't need you to then state that you used your eyeballs to get that visual information. So make this an I statement from our main character, nix the filtering language and put us in this moment instead of putting distance between us in this moment by making it about my opinion as a reader of this scenario. So retool this great opening image, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be fixed. Okay, that was Searching for Danny Boy by Deb Trotter, a, a young adult novel. Whoa, really? Yeah, I guess that maybe it's about a young woman who goes over to Ireland, maybe, in, uh, like on a sort of like post graduation thing and gets mixed up. Could be well. a gap year thing, but I would also check the age on this. Uh, YA taps out at 18 in terms of protagonist age. So. I'm a little curious about this. Uh, you know, the average age for a protagonist at the start of a YA novel is 16. And so I would just question whether or not that actually is YA, it could be new adult, could be adult. Just yeah. a question. Good point. Uh... Preston worked up some fears rang the doorbell. <laughs> um, I love this idea and I love this image. Um, Preston worked up some fake tears. Worked up some fake tears feels a little deflated to me. I think there's stronger, more specific language for um, what's going on here. And I'm almost, I would almost say, take it a step further. Tell me what he thought of in order to call up the fake tears. You know, Preston um, forced himself to think of the saddest image he could remember and then tell us what it is. And maybe it's actually kind of funny or not sad. Um, like his, like, I don't know, dropping a whole case of his favorite wine or like the bottom of a box falling out of a whole case of wine or spilling a latte or just something that is, that tells us something about who Preston is and that that makes him cry and help draw up these fake tears is a really great way to establish tone, establish voice and draw us into this character because I'm intrigued, but you could do more. Uh, that was That Death May Tarry by Brian Wells, a science fiction novel. I really like the title. Consider, if you will, I am at now 
I am at now and you are at then. Huh, okay. Um, this is intriguing. Um, I am at now and you are at then. Yeah, I mean, it's awkward, right? There's something a little bit awkward about the idea of at now as a phrase and at then, but it works. Um, I think it's totally really smooth and unique. And I like this a lot. I think this takes a, a very simple or a very complex idea and, and, and boils it down to its simplest um, expression. And I think what I really like people to see here is that the spareness of the punctuation and the absolute perfection of the grammar is why this sentence works. Yeah, I like this. Well, it's, um, the title, I think, could throw some clues as to what it means. It's called The Quantum Mate. It's a science fiction, but it almost feels like a, a science fiction romance in some ways. Yeah, I was going to say, is this science fiction? Is it time travel romance? I would, I, I think that's... Okay, I'm into it. The Quantum Mate is a great title. Mm -hmm. Really good title. The title game is strong today. Good yeah, job, guys. Good. Um, Plautus never ignored the advice of dead men. <sighs> okay, another real winner. We've got some. This is a great crop of submissions. Uh, and good job choosing, Martin. You've made my my job very <laughs> easy today. Um, I really like this. Uh, I'm interested in the era, the time period. Obviously, this name harkens back to something Greco-Roman. I don't really know where this name comes from, but I'm really interested in this idea, and I like it a lot. Yeah, it's from uh, The Sibyl's Books uh, by Margie Ortega, Historical Fiction. I'm imagining it must be a Roman, uh, I guess, based on the... Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a safe bet. Uh, okay, just do one or two more. I'll put this one down and then search through some of the other ones just for one final one to finish on. Lara folded her two $5 bills carefully and slipped one into each of the red envelopes she had bought at Ralph's that morning. Okay. But why? Um, this is a well-constructed sentence. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. Someone putting money in envelopes is not as interesting to me as why. Um, where is this money going? Who is it for? Is it a gratuity? Like, what is it? And I think that's the more interesting question here. And so to the moment that she delivers the first envelope, if they're not delivered at the same time, I think that might actually bring us in to the story a little faster. This sentence gives me a lot of confidence in this author's writing but I just want to make sure that we're starting in the right place. And I don't think we exactly are. I think, yeah, from, from my cultural background, like money in red envelopes is sort of like a very Chinese thing of like a gift being given, but it might not yes. even be related to this. So I immediately go, oh yeah, in my mind, I made some connections that might not be what the author intended. Yeah, I'm editing a book now where there's a tradition, uh, the, it's a Chinese American family and they have a tradition of a dumpling party um, that involves red envelopes and I think potentially Chinese New Year parties also have, um, you know, monetary gifts in, in red envelopes. And so, uh, again, I think the moment of exchange could be more culturally significant and more informative and enlightening than this moment of preparing the envelopes themselves. Cool. Uh, just one last one. Oh, yeah. And if, uh, if it is intended as a uh, gift uh, from a, a Chinese giver, uh, the, the money denomination would always be an even number and definitely not four. So the five dollar bill would not make sense. <laughs> Whoa! How do you know this? I'm Chinese. Ah, oh, well, I guess then you would know. <laughs> um, that's amazing. What a great, um, like a nuanced detail. I had no idea. That's awesome. And I think uh, this is another. Yeah, I hope we hear from the author because if if that is, you might have just helped them enormously. But do your research, people, especially <laughs> if you're writing outside of your own culture. Uh, okay, a final one here. Oh, sorry, that was from uh, uh, Julia Jorgensen, and it was a piece of literary fiction yet to be titled. Okay. Uh, our very last one of the evening. Thank you very much. Stick around for a second afterwards. I've got a few things to share, so don't, don't disappear just yet. The solid ground finally beneath our feet was that dot in the Mediterranean, the most bombed place in the war, the British island of Malta. Yeah, okay. 
I don't dislike this. This use of finally is a little bit of a question mark for me. Was it an especially long journey? Is this historical fiction? But it has to be post-war. So when exactly are we? This brings up a lot of questions for me. Um, and so I might say, I don't know, but I like the way that Malta is being categorized here, that dot in the Mediterranean, and uh, the way that we're sort of modifying Malta as the most bombed place in the war. I'm interested in this. I think, I'm not sure about it. I think I would have to read the remainder of paragraph one to really understand where we're going with this. It's a well-constructed sentence, and um, most bombed should be hyphenated. Uh, but other than that, I think this is this is interesting. I'm intrigued. I'll, I'll give it a solid B plus. That one uh, is from uh, warned against warned against optimism, uh, a nonfiction historical. Uh, yeah, um, actually, I like. I just want to end on a nice short one. I've I quite liked and skipped over earlier. Uh, okay, just one more. Being the third princess was a curse. This is great. I see why you like this. Um, being the third princess was a curse. The language itself is somewhat passive in the sense that we could activate the action here a little bit more. Um, I wonder if this was framed as an I statement. It depends on the narration. I mean, if it's third person, obviously it's not going to be an I statement, but we could use a character name here. You know, um, you know, as the third princess in the house of Haman, Rebecca was cursed. Or uh, just something slightly more specific to capture this idea, but with a little bit more immediacy and specificity. Those are two things that we're always looking for throughout our prose, but especially in a first line, immediacy, specificity, get it up front. Um, so I love the idea of this. I would love to see it tooled to a slightly finer, honed to a slightly finer point. Cool. And with that, uh, I'm to the end of our live uh, cover critiques. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Becca has kindly offered to record a few more of these. So if you have sent some in, uh, we'll be looking to get to a few more of those and post them on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming weeks. So make sure you hit like and subscribe to our channel, get notifications, all that stuff. I've learned how to uh, be a YouTuber of late. We have to say smash the like button and all that. Um, <laughs> In the comments down here, I'm going to post a few things. The first of all is a link to Becca's profile on Readsy. Uh, she is one of our great, fantastic editors. Uh, Rebecca, would you like to tell the folks what sort of projects you're kind of looking for right now so if people know like they've got something that you'll absolutely love that they can send it your way? Yeah, so I love working on contemporary YA, contemporary adult fiction, romance, uh, I like urban fantasy, but that really excludes your space operas, your first contact novels, ultra high fantasy epics. That's gonna be better for somebody else. And there are some great um, editors on Reezy that specialize in those genres. Um, I'm always interested in dynamic representations of both mental illness and mental health uh, in fiction. And I'm always looking to read more LGBTQIA plus romance in YA and adult. Um, I'm interested in certain historical eras. You can find out more about that on my Reezy profile. And really, I just wanna see your best work. I think the number one problem that I see is people coming in a little bit too early. I want to see the absolute best version of your manuscript. Please don't send me your first draft the moment you hit the end. Um, that is too soon to get a professional critique from someone like me. So that's what I'd like to see. That's when I'd like to see it. And I hope you will reach out. Um, can I tell them where to find me on Twitter so we can all say hi to each other? Yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, you can find me on Twitter at my handle, which is our faith editorial. Uh, my middle name is Faith. Some people want to know where it comes from. Oh, there it is. So our Faith editorial on Twitter. I would love um, to hear from you and say hi and uh, hear about your project on Reedsy. Cool. Uh, speaking of Reedsy, uh, we're having a few more live events in the coming weeks. I know a lot of us are sort of stuck indoors. Uh, and so we put, try to put on a few things that will help you guys stay quite uh, active. Uh, for example, we've been having these write-ins hosted by uh, Jen and Shaylin from our team. Uh, we've had two so far. Basically, you tune in with whatever you're writing. It could be a work in progress. We've got some prompts if you want to use them. 
And then for 20 minute sprints, we just sit down and then you just watch us work in silence. And the idea is that we're all sort of there together. And at the end of 20 minutes, we all take a break together. And it's actually like a lot of fun. And it's a nice sort of social way to sort of keep yourself accountable and, and get through those sprints. It's a, it's a surprisingly good way just to bust through uh, the cobwebs you might be having. And then also the week after that, we have uh, the return of Caroline Levitt, who's a novelist and an editor on Readsy. Uh, she's bringing on one of her friends, uh, a novelist that she edits, and they're going to talk about uh, the first stages of revision. So what you do before you go to an editor after, you know, when you have your first uh, draft done, like how to approach that and the sort of beauty of that. So uh, she'll be going through that with some examples from actual books that have been published uh, traditionally. Uh, and of course, yeah, just the sort of sign up to our, our thing on Eventbrite. There was a link going around earlier. You can join up our newsletters. We send stuff out each week uh, to try to keep you motivated, tips on how to write and all that. Anyway, I've been blethering on long enough. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with our technical difficulties again. Uh, thank you so much, Becca. You are welcome. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. I love doing this. And just reminding everybody to keep an eye on the channel for our recorded First Line Frenzies. If you submitted a line for this broadcast and it didn't get addressed here, there's a really good chance that we will get to it in some of those mini bits. Amazing. Cool. I'll see, catch you all later. Bye.